Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, so uh, let's get right down to business. <laughs> uh, the Riemann zeta function in a celebrated paper written in 1859, Riemann showed that the series summation one over NVS defines an analytic function in the region real S bigger than one. It can be extended analytically to the entire complex plane with only a simple pole at S equals one with residue one. Moreover, it satisfies this remarkable functional equation, one half SS minus one, pi to the minus S over two, gamma S over two, zeta S is equal to C of one minus S. Uh, the half will appear, uh, will become important later as we talk in, the, in the, this uh, lecture. In the same paper, he noted the existence of the Euler product, zeta S is product over prime numbers, one minus one over P of the S inverse, and it gives us a link between the properties of the zeta function and the distribution of prime numbers. So to under, underline this, he gave a heuristic derivation of the explicit formula for pi of x, the number of primes up to x in terms of the complex zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So an amazing paper uh, full of uh, ideas, perhaps not fully exhausted even as of now. <clears throat> And in that paper, uh, motivated by the symmetry of the functional equation, along with some preliminary computations, he stated what is now called the Riemann hypothesis, that all complex zeros of zeta s lie on the line real s equals a half. This hypothesis, along with various generalizations, is still an unsolved problem. However, there have been reformulations that link it to probability theory. And so I want to talk a little bit about those links in this, in this lecture. So we'll delve deeper into this connection. First review the Poisson summation formula and the derivation of the functional equation. So given a C infinity function F, we define its Fourier transform as F hat of T, uh, F of integral of F of X e to the minus two pi X T dx. And then the Poisson formula, summation formula is simply summation F of N is the same as summation F hat of N with this, with this particular definition of the, of the Fourier transform. Um, now, if we can apply this Poisson summation formula to this function f of t e to the minus pi a plus t over root x whole squared, then a simple computation using your favorite uh, method shows that f hat of t is root x e to the two pi a t root x e to the minus pi t squared x, essentially coming from the fact that e to the minus pi t squared is its own Fourier transform. And then you apply the Poisson summation formula and lo and behold, you get this beautiful identity, uh, summation e to the minus pi a plus n over root x full squared is equal to square root of x times e to the minus pi n squared x to pi i a n root x. I'm sure all of you have seen this before. And in particular, when a equals zero, you get what's called the Jacobi theta uh, functional equation, which is summation e to the minus pi n squared over x is equal to root x e to the minus pi n squared x. Now this is basically Riemann's starting point. He notices that this functional equation of the theta function will imply a functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. And uh, thanks to, um, I believe it's Hecke or others, we know, or Hamburger or something, I think Hamburger maybe, um, it goes backwards as well. So we'll put theta of t is equal to e to the minus pi n squared t. And so the above uh, identity translates to the functional equation, uh, theta of one over x equals square root of x, theta of x. Now, uh, this is a modular form of weight one half and uh, the ambiguity of the square root sign has always been uh, an important feature. And it is remarkable that in the theory of modular forms that this deeper understanding of this, this transformation formula didn't appear until uh, Shimura's uh, theory of uh, half integral weight modular forms. So the functional equation for uh, the zeta function uh, begins with Riemann's paper where he notices that uh, if you take the gamma function and the gamma function is an integral zero infinity to the minus t t to the s of minus one dt and uh, change variables, uh, put uh, um, t equals n squared x or something, and then uh, you get gamma of s over two n to the minus s. Uh, and as an integral involving e to the minus n squared x, x to the s over two dx over x, changing x to pi x in the integral and summing over n, we end up getting that pi to the minus s over two gamma s over two zeta s is the 
essentially the Mellon transform of the Jacobi data function. So this is, this is straight out of Riemann's paper. Uh, the function of brackets is not quite the theta function, as you will know. The theta function went from minus infinity to infinity. So uh, you have to um, uh, modify that. So the modification is done as uh, in the obvious sort of way. To, so put w of x to be half of the theta function. And we see that the functional equation for the uh, theta function translates into a functional equation of the w function. And injecting that into our integral, we see that the integral can be split into two parts. And once you split the uh, integral into two parts, and the first integral change x to one over x, so that the integral then becomes an integral from one to infinity again. And lo and behold, you get um, this uh, transformation. And finally, that um, this equals x minus s over two times these uh, residual terms, uh, and then uh, those residual terms contribute one over s and one over s minus one, uh, and then lo and behold, you get the integral one to infinity, x to the one minus s over two, w of x, dx over x. So putting everything together um, and combining these calculations, you get pi to the minus s over two, gamma s over two zeta s equals one over s s minus one, integral one to infinity, w of x, x to the s over two, plus x to the one minus s over two, dx over x. And uh, so w of x is this truncated Jacobi function. So you have this function that satisfies the functional equation, um, zeta, uh, sorry, c of s equals c of one minus s, and it extends to an entire function because this integral, this integral here, is an entire function because now w of x, remember starting from one to infinity is an exponential decay. And therefore this integral makes sense for all values of s. So that's the proof of the functional equation. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, derivation. And uh, the reason for putting a half in front of the xc function will become apparent as we go on with the talk. Uh, now the functions g of y and h of y, uh, if we change, uh, the variables, instead of looking at theta of y, you look at theta of y squared and call that g of y, then the functional equation for theta translates to g of one over y equals y g of y. You remove the ambiguity of the square root sign. This one, I, I suppose this is one of the motivations for making this change of variable. Then uh, you can rewrite your c of s as two c of s, s is minus one, integral zero to infinity, g of y minus one, y the s dy over y. And if you set h of y to be uh, d by dy, y squared d by d by g of y, um, then you get a differential equation involving g of y, 2yg prime of y plus y squared g double prime of y. And noting that uh, g prime of y can be written as a, as a as summation pi n squared y, e to the minus pi n squared pi squared. And g double prime of y can also be similarly written. You have these terms. Uh, you find that uh, h of y is actually 4y squared times summation n going from 1 to infinity, 2 pi squared n to the 4y squared minus 3 pi, pi n squared e to the minus pi n squared y squared. So uh, why am I going through all this? It's because uh, this is going to be important. h of y and g of y turn out to be uh, non-negative functions. So uh, c of s is a Mellon transform of h of y. So h of y satisfies the same functional equation as g of y, and it's not obvious, of course, you have to check it, uh, and I'll just leave the details uh, because this talk is being taped, you can um, see these slides at your leisure, but basically uh, you do the obvious differentiations and check uh, routine verification that h of one of y is actually y times h of y. So Riemann's uh, formula for c of s then becomes two c of s, integral zero to infinity, h of y, y to the s dy over y. In other words, I've expressed c of s as a Mellon transform of h of y, but h of y is this funny modified data function and two pi squared n to the four y squared is bigger than three pi n squared for y bigger than or equal to one. We see that h of y is positive in the region y bigger than equal to one. But because h of y satisfies this functional equation, 
h of y is also h of one over y is y h of y. Therefore, it satisfies a positivity condition for y positive as well. So in other words, the bottom line is that two C of s is the Mellon transform of a positive function. H of y is now a positive function. Now, this is all due to polia. Uh, and I'll talk about polia in a second. In other words, C of s is the Mellon transform of a non-negative function, H of y. And that's the, that's the starting point for uh, much of the discussion of the connection between probability theory and uh, the Riemann zeta function. So uh, if we, we've proved that two C of S is the integral zero to infinity, uh, H of Y, Y dS, D Y over Y, the observation will now be used to move into a probabilistic view of the zeta function, uh, checking what C of one is uh, in the usual way, way you find that uh, it's equal to a half and that explains the two. Two times C of zero is the same as two times C of one is equal to one. In other words, we have the integral zero to infinity h of y over y dy uh, is equal to the integral zero to infinity h of y dy and it's equal to one. In other words, h of y being non-negative and the integral being equal to one allows you to interpret h of y as a probability density function. This is an amazing, an amazing idea. As I said, it's all due to polia. Um, therefore, h of y can be viewed as a density function of a probability distribution on zero to infinity. And these integrals tell you that the mean value of this distribution is one. So we also deduce from the same formula because of the positivity that C of s has no positive real zeros. This is going to show up later on in the discussion, uh, but it, out of this, uh, I mean, there are other ways of showing that the zeta, Riemann zeta function has no positive uh, zeros, but this is uh, one way of doing it. And this becomes important uh, when I want to discuss uh, current developments. So the probability density h of y, so far we've shown that two C of s is the Mellon transform of h of y. Uh, h of y is positive for y positive. So in general, if you take a random variable with this distribution h of y, the functional equation then translates as the expected value of f of one over y equals the expected value of y times f of y. And in particular, if we put uh, y to be uh, y of the s as the, as the random variable, one can view uh, two C of s as the expected value of the random variable y to the s. All of this, as I said, is due to polia 1926. Uh, and certainly it was part of the Hilbert polia dream of finding a Hermitian operator whose eigenvalues are equal to i times rho minus a half, where rho runs through the zeros of C of s. Notice, by the way, the trivial zeros of the Riemann data function do not appear anymore in C of s. They've been eliminated. So C of s, the zeros of C of s are the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann data function. And Polya devoted a substantial portion of his research to the study of Fourier transforms of functions, all of whose real ze uh, zeros are real. So in one paper, he shows that if we just take the first term of the Fourier expansion of H of, uh, that H of Y, the first, I'm sorry, it's not the Fourier expansion, it's that data, func data function-like expansion, right? It's e to the minus pi n squared t with certain coefficient. If we just take the first coefficient, first term, uh, he actually wrote a paper in which he analyzed the zeros of the Mellon transform of that thing and showed that all the zeros are real, corresponding to uh, what you would probably expect for the C function as well. Now, in 1997, uh, uh, Jean Jin Li derived an elegant criterion for the truth of the Riemann hypothesis, um, defined these numbers, lambdas of n, summation rho, one minus one over rho to the n, where the sum is over non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Then Li's criterion is that the Riemann hypothesis is true if and only if all the lambda n's are non-negative. This is a very famous uh, paper of Jian Jin Li. Uh, we, we want this to hold for all natural numbers n. Now it's not difficult to see that uh, the lambda n's can be rewritten as one over n minus one factorial, the nth derivative 
of s to the n minus one times log of c of s evaluated at s equal to one. In other words, we're taking the ex Laurent expansion of s to the n minus one logs uh, or whatever this, and then calculating the coefficient. So this is one interpretation of the lambdas of n's in terms of the log of the c function. Now, given our probabilistic interpretation of C of S as um, the expected value of the random variable Y of the S, the Lie constants now also have a probabilistic inter interpretation in terms of uh, cumulance, cumulants, which we now review. So let me uh, give you a quick crash course on what cumulants of a probability distribution are. Uh, given a random variable X, the moment generating function uh, is the expected value of e to the tx, and the cumulant generating function is log of the expected value of e to the tx. And one can relate the moments and to the cumulants as follows. So if you write the expected value of uh, e to the tx, um, easy to see that the coefficients are the moments of the distribution. And if I write the series as one plus s of t, um, then s of t converges, let's say, in a sufficiently small neighborhood of t equals zero, and you can take a log of this thing and make an expansion. Uh, and then uh, we see from this that um, the um, cumulants, which are the, coefficient, the coefficients of the um, um, log of e to the tx. Um, so the, I need to look at the coefficient of the t to the k, that, that's the k, uh, the, so you should call it k. Um, the um, coefficient of t to the n in this expansion we'll call it the nth cumulant. And so you can write down uh, formulas for the cumulants in terms of the moments of the original problem distribution. Now notice that K1 is the mean value of X, M1 is the first moment, that's just the expected value, that's the mean value. And K2 is the variance, uh, the expected value of X minus the mean squared. And that's always positive, isn't it? Expected value of a non-negative function is always non-negative. It's a density function, therefore it's non-negative. Uh, K2 will always be positive for any random variable uh, X. So these two comments, that K1 um, and K2 are related in this fashion will become important as we, as we proceed. So the relation between the, uh, the cumulants and the coefficients. So one can in fact give an explicit relation between the moments and the cumulants as follows. Uh, put f of t equal to e to the tx, and then you just um, look at the log of that thing. That's what, how you get the cumulants. So the cumulant generating function, just log of that. And we differentiate it so that we, we get some handle on the things and multiplying true by t times f of t, comparing the coefficient of t to the n on both sides, we obtain a beautiful formula uh, that the nth moment of the original distribution is recursively determined in terms of the previous moments and the previous cumulants. And in other words, the nth moment can be written as uh, the summation n minus one choose j, m sub j times k sub n minus j. Now, if y is a random variable with density function h of y, as we said at the beginning, let's put L equals log of one over y. Then we go back to our uh, probabilistic interpretation of the Riemann zeta function to C of S as the expected value of Y of the S, which is also by the functional equation, the expected value of Y the one minus S. And when we write um, Y as uh, you know, L equals log of one over Y, we can write the ex expected value of E the S minus one times L. And uh, we can expand this ex uh, series in terms of S minus one and we get these cumulants. And so this gives us a probabilistic view of uh, Lee's criterion. We've already noted that the Lee criterion numbers are given by this, this, this formula lambda sub n, and using the Leibniz rule, we can rewrite this thing. The Leibniz rule meaning if you wanna compute the nth derivative or product of two functions, then you have a, an expression of a binomial expression like this. And then lo and behold, you get a nice uh, clean formula of the lambda sub n's in terms of the cumulants uh, of, the, uh, of the distribution attached to the Riemann zeta function. So, so the cumulants k sub n are just the nth derivative of log c of s uh, evaluated as equal to one. So if all the cumulants now were positive, 
then we will have the Riemann hypothesis. Um, so now this is not the Riemann hypothesis, Riemann hypothesis factorial. Okay, so <laughs> we'll have quite quite a bit if they were all positive. I think we'll have much more. Unfortunately, the case of n's are not always positive. Case of case of three is negative, and case of four is also negative. But as you can see, they're not that much away from zero. Really. So it's an interesting phenomenon. This is the source of this uh, discussion. It's all a uh, remarkable paper by uh, B.N. Pittman and Yor uh, that appeared about 20 years ago in the bulletin BMS, um, 2001. So if, for those who are interested, uh, I would recommend this paper. It's a very well-written paper. Uh, the positivity of uh, lambda one and lambda two uh, are easy to see. We already know the connection between moments and cumulants. Um, in the case of the zeta function, the lambda one coefficient, if you, do, if you remember, boils down to summation one over rho, and summation one over rho, you pair up rho with rho bar, and then you end up getting two lambda one is two times real part of rho over mod rho squared, which is obviously positive. So it's easy to see the first Lie coefficient is, is non-negative in, in this case. Uh, and, and for most all zeta functions, you can, you can probably do this. As for K2, um, remember that um, this K2 was related to the variance and therefore it's always positive. So K2 is always positive and therefore Lambda one and Lambda two are positive for uh, the uh, uh, Riemann zeta function. So the negativity of some of the higher cumulants is disappointing. However, all is not lost because we can apply a 1999 variation of these criterion due to Bombieri and Ligarius which offers some hope for this probabilistic approach. So, so before we abandon the, uh, you know, the cumulant research on the cumulants and their growth rates and how bad they are, uh, we are encouraged by the uh, paper by Bungaria and Agarius, which I will discuss right now. So variants of these criterion. So Bungaria and Agarius gave an axiomatic treatment of these paper that's quite general. Uh, let S be a multi-set of complex numbers rho such that um, zero and one are not in the set. And if rho is in the set, then one minus rho is also in the set and rho bar is in the set with the same multiplicity. So it sounds like a functional equation here, um, very much like the zeta function or zeta functions of uh, number fields or whatever you would like. Uh, and then we just put some con convergence condition and this is all satisfied for um, any function in the Selber class all these zeta functions uh, that we've ever seen in life, I suppose, at least in my part of the world, uh, are all of order one, um, except for the Selberg zeta function, which is order two, but that's a different animal altogether. But in the case of the classical L functions, we have order one functions, and this number three is always satisfied. And then the, the theorem of Bombier and Ligarius is that the following conditions are equivalent. In the real part of every element in the set is a half, is equivalent to the Lie criterion, is equivalent to this weaker criterion that all these numbers are bigger than minus C of epsilon e to the epsilon n. So you see this, this criterion is amazing uh, because it really allows us, allows you quite a bit of leeway. They could be negative, the, the, the cumulants could be negative, but as long as the, um, the growth is under control of some sort. I mean, you have to still do those binomial coefficients, but essentially that's the philosophy. Uh, so the, now the Lie the, the constants are interesting for other reasons. Forget the Riemann hypothesis. They're interesting for other reasons uh, in their own right. And the arithmetic nature of the Lie constants is uh, perhaps to be recollected. The cumulants Kn are related to the Stelchus constants gamma sub n, which are defined as the uh, coefficient of Laurent expansion about the Riemann zeta function at s equals one. So these are the Taylor coefficients or Laurent coefficients of zeta s at s equals one. Uh, gamma zero is the familiar Euler constant when we use gamma sub n's as generalizations of this. In fact, uh, we'll show that gamma sub n's are limited, uh, given by these limits that basically minus one to the n over n factorial times these limits. Um, generalized Euler constants. And these uh, numbers, by the way, are interesting in their own right and perhaps should be studied uh, for other reasons as well. And this was first proved by Chawla and Briggs in 1955 that the gamma sub n's are given by this nice neat little formula. 
And um, as with all Charles' papers, they contain beautiful ideas, but are never set up in generality. So for youngsters who are listening, uh, maybe it's a good idea to, some of, to study some of Charles' papers. Um, it may be useful here to have a general theorem with a view to applying it to other data functions. So here's the general theorem. Suppose that you have a Dirichlet series at s equals summation a n over n p s. Analytic for real s bigger than equal to one with only a simple pole at s equal to one with residue one. Assume that the summatory uh, function a at summation a n is x plus e of x with e of x satisfying a modest error uh, term e o of x over log to the a x for any a. Then you look at the Laurent expansion of f of s at s equals one, and you can write down a c sub k to be minus one to the k over k factorial times this uh, expression. Now I wrote down log to the k one, you may think it's, oh, isn't that zero? Well, it is, if k is um, bigger than equal to one. If k is equal to zero, it's not, okay. it's one. <laughs> so uh, I, I prefer to write it like that. But anyway, this is essentially a beautiful um, paper and um, minor modifications in, in Charles paper leads to this. I, I say this because we would like to apply it for Zeta prime over zeta two, um, and in the in the Bombieri Ligarius paper, they derive uh, similar co uh, formulas um, using Bayes explicit formula. There's really no need for that uh, here. So we're more interested in the generalized Tilchus constant zeta sub n given by the Laurent expansion uh, of zeta s zeta prime of s over zeta of s at what s equals one. Plus, you have um, these coefficients of minus zeta prime of zeta as being the Stelchus constants, eta sub n. And the interest in uh, these constants is that we can, uh, following Bomberian and Ligaris, who used the Bayes explicit formula to derive the following formula for lambda sub n's, they, they split it up into uh, four parts. Uh, the first part's nice, second part's nice, third part's nice, and it's the fourth part that's kind of interesting. So S1 of n is summation n choose j minus one over j, one minus one over two j, zeta j. And S2 of n is this expression with um, the um, Stelchus constants. Yeah, uh, so, so this is what we have. So since they showed that Lee's criterion can be considerably weakened to proving that if for any epsilon positive, there's a constant C of epsilon positive such that lambda of n's are always bigger than minus C of epsilon to the n, e to the epsilon n. We'll be interested in the growth of the terms, the two terms here on the right-hand side. And um, interestingly, S1 of n, which is the term here, can be analyzed very easily. Um, it's almost like first-year calculus. Uh, if you just do the obvious, shove in the uh, series for zeta j and interchange and analyze it, and lo and behold, you get a very nice um, series and you have to analyze does this converge? And the answer is yes. And then you apply the integral test <laughs> to estimate it. And, and so you end up getting S1 of n, turns out to be O of n log n. And Mark Coffey, who is actually a physicist, who has been playing with these um, terms for a long time. Um, sadly, I learned uh, that um, he died about two years ago. I hope it's not due to COVID, um, but he certainly was, um, not very old. Um, and he's been interested in, in this func these functions for a long time. And he proved this remarkable formula that S1 of n is asymptotic to one half n log n, plus all these very nice terms. So I told you to show O of n log n is first year calculus, but if you do a little bit more careful analysis, you can actually get this uh, asymptotic formula. So in other words, if we're trying to show lambda sub n's are bigger than minus, E the epsilon n, you know, exponential growth, but negative exponential growth, you, you may as well ignore the first three terms and focus your attention on S2. And S2 contains only the Stelchus constants. So this can be, now I told you this can be derived without using the phase explicit formula. Um, I gave a course on probability and, and, uh, and number theory last term at the Fields Academy. And I actually proved that without the explicit formula. So the study of S2 of n, um, to prove the Riemann hypothesis, to study S2 of n um, and show it's not too negative, that's what we need to do. 
Um, and these are the numbers. And what I find fascinating about um, the very assertion is that you get the Riemann hypothesis by knowing what the Riemann zeta function is doing at s equals one. So what is it doing at s equals one? That determines the entire Riemann hypothesis. You know, it was amazing. So one can actually prove that the eta's they're not positive, unfortunately. They actually oscillate in sign. And this again, I've seen some papers. Uh, they're proving it using rather complicated methods. Uh, it can be deduced via power series analog of Landau's theorem uh, for Dirichlet series called Pringsheim's theorem. So many of you may be familiar with Landau's uh, theorem about Dirichlet series with non-negative coefficients. Um, Pringsheim's theorem is a power series version of that. It was proved in 1894, well before Landau's theorem. Uh, so the statement is that if zero is less than R is less than infinity, if you have a power series summation A and Z to the N with radius of convergence capital R, A and Z are all non-negative, then F of, F of Z has a singularity of Z equals R. And the proof is identical, actually. The proof with Landau's theorem and proof with Prinzheim's theorem is actually identical. So I'm not going to go through it, of course. But, uh, now, if you apply this in, in, your, in the case of the zeta prime of zeta and, and ask yourself, are they a fixed sign after a while, then you analyze F of S truncated and, and see the right-hand side, let's say is, is a fixed sign coefficients. And then applying Pringsheim's theorem tells you that um, it has to have a real singularity, but there is no real singularity um, because zeta prime over zeta has no uh, real um, zero, except apart from the trivial zeros. And there's no positive real singularity. So that's the proof. That's the proof of Pringheim's theorem that allows you to show that these eta's oscillate in sign. Now, further study of the eta j's from our generalization of the Chala Briggs theorem, we have um, that the eta j's can be given by this formula. As I, said, I point this out simply because uh, you know, the Bombier Ligarius paper gets this formula, which is a beautiful formula, via the uh, Bayes explicit formula. Uh, so the lambda sub m is the usual uh, von Mangel function. Uh, this expression is very unwieldy. We will try to um, offer another expression for it via Laguerre polynomials. Uh, so psi of x is summation lambda m uh, n less than x. And we can write uh, minus c prime over c, uh, c of s as uh, the Mellon transform of psi of x. And uh, doing the obvious separating out the pole and writing the integral psi of x or minus x over x to the s plus one allows you to uh, expand the integral into a Laurent expansion and get a formula for all these um, eta days. I mean, these Stelzius constants. So the Stelzius constants can actually be written down in terms of the error function and delta capital delta of x is minus psi of x minus x. And so if we let delta j to be Cap, the integral of delta of x log to the jx over x squared dx, then a to j can be written as a difference of these two delta j's. And writing it in this fashion allows us to bring in uh, the Laguerre polynomials. The Laguerre polynomial, if you're not familiar, um, is summation n choose j minus x to the power j over j factor. It's a beautiful uh, pol polynomial. And then there's generalized Laguerre polynomials as well. well. We'll come to that in a second. And it's now possible to rewrite S2 of n using Laguerre polynomials. So the generalized Laguerre polynomials are, are going to be introduced soon. So S2 of n can then be rewritten. You know, the A to j's have now been written in terms of the delta j's. And therefore, you get these two terms minus n gamma zero, t1 of n, t2 of n, corresponding to these new coefficients. And t1 of n can be written as an integral uh, involving the Laguerre polynomials. And t2 of n can also be written as an integral involving Laguerre polynomials. Here, they're not quite Laguerre polynomials. They're these generalized Laguerre polynomials where you do a shift on the binomial coefficient. So anyway, the bottom line is S2 of n can be written as integrals of Laguerre polynomials. And the uh, point is that the, the, uh, the formula, when we write it in that fashion, <clears throat> we, um, we get that S2 of n is minus n gamma zero times uh, minus n one to infinity delta of x over x squared, plus these two terms involving these generalized Laguerre polynomials, one to infinity delta of x over x squared, ln minus one, uh, 
uh, LR minus two value log X. <clears throat> this can be further simplified uh, to give that S2 of N is actually minus N gamma zero uh, plus the integral one to infinity delta of X over X squared LN minus one superscript two log X minus N one to infinity delta of X over X squared DX. Now, interestingly enough, so S2 of N has now been broken up into three parts. So this is obviously innocuous given the von Mary Ligarius uh, criterion. And this also equally can be shown to be completely innocuous uh, given the error term on the prime number theorem. So last term in the above equation, actually O of N by simple back application of the unconditional error term in the prime, prime number theorem. So to prove the Riemann hypothesis, therefore we need to focus on the integral in the second term. So, uh, so that's, what, that's where I would like to stop. I just want to kind of make a give uh, a quick um, uh, um, prediction, uh, I don't know what the word is, but um, thematic future directions, let's put it that way, thematic future directions. The most fascinating aspect of Lee's criterion and the companion arithmetic formulas is that the behavior of zeta of s at s equals one determines the location of all the non-trivial zeros. I find that very interesting. Lee's criterion has been studied for a number of fields. It's been studied for the Selber class by a galaxy of authors. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to one particular paper uh, by Francis Brown, who um, did the Lee criterion in the number field context for Dedekind and zeta functions and noticed that the positivity of lambda two, which was um, child's play in the case of the Riemann zeta function simply because it was the uh, interpreted as a variance of a probability density function and therefore non-negative. Um, in the Dedekind zeta function case, uh, it's not so simple. We do not have a probabilistic interpretation of the Dedekind zeta function. In the paper by, uh, you know, uh, BN and uh, company, we have um, small cases. I believe they do some uh, maybe the Gaussian ring or something like that, something like that, some, some small number fields in which they look at that um, and um, um, they, they say similar things can be done. Um, so, that, But in general, to do the number field situation, um, this um, uh, I find this fascinating. Uh, lambda two, the positivity of lambda two for the Dedekind and zeta function, of course, hinges on the fact that can you repeat Polya's calculation of um, interpreting the uh, Dedekind zeta function or appropriate version of it, you know, modified by gamma functions and so on and so forth, as the um, uh, Mellon transform of a non negative probability distribution? So that still seems to be quite open. So if one had a probabilistic view of the Dedekind zeta function that could lead to the solution of the Siegel zero problem, uh, then we come to another theme. So I'm giving you some branches of, you know, research that uh, I think uh, are fascinating. Um, Freitas and others have studied what are, what's called the modified Lee criterion. So if I was interested in a quasi-Riemann hypothesis, no zeros to the right of sigma, can I establish <clears throat> a similar criterion? And the answer is uh, yes, you can. Um, you can do that. So the whole program of Lee, as well as the program of Bombier Ligarius, can be transplanted to study the quasi GRH. However, as, a, as far as I'm aware, um, the um, study of the um, probabilistic interpretation of the quasi GRH Lee criteriums in terms of probability theory has not been fully unraveled. So the arithmetic nature of the Stelzius constants is again of interest in transcendental number theory, as well as most of you know, the Euler constant is known, um, is not known to be transcendental, is not even known to be irrational. Uh, however, I find this very fascinating that um, the, uh, these Euler constants show up. And uh, there's a nice paper by uh, Ihara and uh, Kumar Murthy. Um, on um, what's called the euler kronecker constants. And these again are essentially Stelchus type constants 
that arise in the context of the Dedekind zeta function that seem to play a very important role. So it seems to me that there's a, a big uh, program of studying these constants in the large, in, in a kind of a very abstract sort of way. So it would be of interest to review many of these results, go back, review these studies of Stelzer's constants um, for number fields, Selberg class, automorphic cell functions, and so on and so forth in terms of a probabilistic angle. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Well. <laughs>